Hello everyone and welcome to the briefing room. My name is Michael Lee and I'm the research and analysis manager here at ClimateWorks Centre. Today we'll be discussing the potential for decarbonisation in Australia's industry and energy sectors. In the past year we've been doing some modelling on decarbonisation pathways for both sectors and we've gained insights into the make or break technologies that influence how those sectors can achieve net zero emissions. But first of all, let's begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands for which each of us are dialing in today. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waters of the Kulin Nation on which the Kwan Works office uh, is located and pay my respects to the elders past and present. And I extend my respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us today. Please feel free to use the chat to tell us where you're dialing in from. We will be taking your questions, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to submit them at any time. Today's discussion about decarbonising industry and energy is all about planning. Australia needs to plan now for the transition to net zero because this gives certainty to investors, builds public support for, builds, uh, support for public investments, and creates a social licence for change. Effective planning also helps decision makers to lay the groundwork for what's needed in the future. Now, I'll be the first to admit that planning a transition of this magnitude is pretty challenging, mainly because who knows what the future holds. But that, essentially, that's a big part of what Climeworks does. We work with government and business to develop plans, implement actions, and make decisions that put us on track towards net zero emissions and Paris Agreement goals. We often refer to this work as developing pathways. Now, when it comes to developing pathways for our stakeholders, we often use scenario modeling as a tool to provide a robust, credible evidence base that backs up our recommendations. In this webinar, we'll explore two case studies where our scenario modeling has offered insights on what technology and policies are needed for net zero, in industry and energy, to support us in developing pathways for the energy and industry sectors. Over this next hour, you'll hear from Dr. Glenn Curry, the Program Impact Manager for our energy team, and Roe Maxwell, Senior Project Manager for our research analysis and modeling team. Let's kick off with our first speaker, Dr. Glenn Curry. Glenn manages ClimateWorks Energy System Program, focusing on delivering system scale change to support energy transitions in Australia and Southeast Asia. With more than 20 years of experience in energy systems and strategic transformations, Glenn brings experience from academia, business and government to ClimateWorks. His research and teaching experience ranges from, uh, ranges from uh, energy, consumer and demand side research, solar PV business, pumped hydro, hydrogen distribution, transmission, climate change, and system engineering. Pretty long list there, Glenn. I'm, pre I'm pleased to introduce him now. So over to you, Glenn. Well, thanks, Michael. Uh, it's great to be with you today. And uh, today I'll explain to our uh, audience about how our models used for energy planning and investment in Australia. So we've been building our model for about 15 years, really, and bringing information in. And, uh, and it maps the decarbonisation in Australia. And we use this model with a lot of stakeholders. Today, we'll talk about how it's used to plan the Australian energy transition via our work with the Australian Energy Market Operator, or AEMO. And we also work in the Asia Pacific, but today we're focused on Australia. As seen on this slide, our energy work generating policy advice and technical answers for the energy transition benefits hugely from the Climate Works model. Our models are JV with CSRO. It's a model that includes various technologies and covers all Australian states and territories and includes all types of energy supply and the energy use sectors such as industry and domestic customers. The models used by AEMO in their integrated system plan or ISP and it helps them plan the gas and electricity system. ClimateWorks develops pathways for a 1.5 degree transition and energy is the first part of that transition. All the energy technologies available now and the Least cost transmission shows energy is decarbonising first. Therefore, the AEMO integrated system plan is an important way that our model can map energy investments for the next 20 years. It shows that electricity demand will more than double in the next 20 years, and we can do that in 
with the process of phasing out coal in the next 15. So our modeling's focused on decarbonizing with a 1.5 degree pathway. It's not just a line on a chart, it's a calculation of the least cost method of taking the carbon out of our system. AEMO's taken our modelling and drawn the line on this chart. They processed our 1.5 degree model further and with their stakeholders concluded a 1.8 C pathways more likely. The line on this chart shows the least cost path to removing ca carbon consistent with a 1.8 C deg degree increase and represents the step change scenario generated by EMO, which suggests that in 20 years, there'll be 30 times the storage, nine times grid renewables, five times rooftop top solar, and a bit of an increase in peaking gas. We may follow another path, but the modeling shows us, or it allows us to imagine a path we could follow and sets the parameters that allow investment in solar, wind, storage, and transmission to start. So a key role for climate works is to help form appropriate policy to keep the costs of the transition down while ensuring continued energy reliability during the peak demand periods and equitable access. This map shows the transmission, solar and wind in Eastern Australia in the AEMO 2022 ISP. It shows the scale of investment needed in each area it helps AEMO and investors make decisions about where to invest in solar, transmission, wind, and storage. This, this maps the outcome of our work with AEMO and essentially shows no regrets. Infrastructure, you might ask, what is no regrets? It, it means that these things can pretty much be built and utilized, even if technology and business prove to be different to expectation. In aqua blue, you can see between Tassie and Victoria, a blue line on the map. This connects Tasmania's wind and hydro to the rest of Australia, for example. In total, all of the blue lines, which are the transmission under construction at the moment, are worth about $13 billion. Future transmission is shown in with black lines and wind is the blue dots and solar is the yellow dots. We're also doing this modeling again for the 2024 ISP, which includes biomethane, energy efficiency, electrification, land-based sequestration, and we've added West Australia modeling as well. We note that some places in Australia will generate and use a lot more electricity than they do today. This map shows the places with the highest energy use in the future plan. There'd be clusters of businesses, maybe minerals processes and industries, uh, other industries, and powered by 100% renewable energy through local generation or transmission. And they'd increase their competitiveness by sharing infrastructure. Might include water, transport, ports, renewable electricity, transmission, storage, green hydrogen, even sharing supplies of decarbonised feedstock. So the, this is a plan that we might see. And if we, we zoom in on uh, two of the, the areas, and that in this map it's got Gladstone and Hunter, we can see that that includes solar, onshore wind, and offshore wind that might be included. And these are all seen, all shown in the 2022 ISP. So we can see that planning and uh, how it would connect with the rest of Australia. We remember, though, that the energy transition is far more than just solar, wind, storage and transmission. We must also phase out coal and gas, modernise the electricity system, manage demand, and that means reducing demand during times when the wind and solar can't, uh, wind and, um, solar can't actually generate the power, and importantly, ensure an equitable transition. The Gladstone and Hunter precincts shown here would need to consider all of these. And this is how our work feeds into government policy and private investment.
Thank you, Gwen. That was really insightful. And as someone who was personally involved in some of that modeling you're referring to, it's great to hear your insights on how that fits into the broader AMO energy system planning process. So thanks for that. Now, we will be having a Q&A session after this last presentation from Rose. So please submit your questions at any time using the Q&A function at the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. If you've just joined us, welcome to Climate Centre's briefing room, where we're talking about decarbonising Australia's industry and energy sectors. We're exploring two case studies where Climeworks has developed pathways backed by scenario modelling to offer insights and advice to relevant stakeholders in these sectors. My name is Michael Lee. I'm the Research and Analysis Manager here at Climeworks. You've just heard from our Program Impact Manager for Energy, Dr. Glenn Curry. And next up, we'll hear from Ro Maxwell. Ro is a Senior Project Manager for our Research, Analysis and Modelling team. As part of a long list of Climeworks research projects, Roy recently led the research and modelling for the Australian Industry Energy Transition Initiative, or ETI, which published decarbonisation pathways for heavy industry earlier this year. She's also leading the modelling work we do for state governments right now. Over to you, Roy. Thanks, Michael, and hi, everyone. As Glenn highlighted, the regions that are home to Australia's highest emitting industries will be sites of significant renewable energy use. Over the past three years, we've been developing decarbonisation pathways for five heavy industry supply chains, and then looking at the regional opportunities they present. We did this modelling, as Michael mentioned, as part of the Australian Industry ETI project, which identified a possible, though challenging, pathway to decarbonise Australian industry. The approach that we used for the modelling included comparing the results of three different scenarios. The scenarios we looked at were an incremental scenario, an industry-led scenario and a coordinated action scenario, which I've just listed in terms of increasing amount of ambition. We also conducted sensitivity analyses for the most ambitious scenario to isolate key technological or economic factors to understand their impact on the size and the speed of possible decarbonisation. Taking this sort of approach allows us to test the robustness of our work and build confidence in the results as well as allowing stakeholders to interrogate and use the work going forwards. So what did we find from the process of comparing scenarios? I'll talk you through a few examples. To start with, what we're looking at here is a chart showing different types of industrial emissions, including direct energy emissions in yellow, for example, burning gas on site to generate heat, non-energy emissions in red, which can also be called fugitive emissions, which release directly from a process, for example, methane leakage, and electricity emissions, which are in blue, which can also be called indirect or scope two emissions, which are from the generation of electricity offsite. Firstly, from the chart, we can see that for industry, the electricity related emissions are amongst the quickest and most cost effective to abate. Again, these are the blue sections on the chart. And the clear preference for early abatement in this sector across all three scenarios really highlights it as a no regrets action to support industrial decarbonisation. We also found that in the long term, increased uptake of renewable energy leads to lower electricity prices nationally. This supports the decarbonisation of other sectors by reducing input costs and incentivising further electrification. When comparing the different overall abatement options and decarbonisation pathways for the three scenarios, we see that some of the most impactful technologies for industry involve electrification or renewable hydrogen. In the more ambitious scenarios, these technologies were taken up early and make up a large share of the abatement effort. This early adoption contributes to the reduction we see here in the direct energy emissions uh, as the yellow sections on the chart decline rapidly in coordinated action, the scenario on the right. Interestingly, we found that even the least ambitious incremental scenario, which is on the left here, sees significant investment in the energy system, which is seen in the green and gray sections of this cumulative investment chart. And this shows that the rollout of renewable energy and decarbonisation of the grid is considered a no regrets action across the board. This is the kind of insight we can get from scenarios that can help decision makers looking for actionable information. Decarbonising the grid and focusing on industrial regions is a smart investment that has positive ripple effects throughout the economy. We also see the incremental scenario invest in a significant amount of industrial electrification due to the reduced fuel costs and increased efficiency of these technologies. This is considered another no regrets action. Let's now look at the different players involved. The three scenarios are also a comparison of how different actors affect the transition to net zero. 
in the incremental scenario, industry, the finance sector and government take slow, less coordinated actions. As its name suggests, the industry-led scenario represents industry taking actions that are generally not supported by government or other sectors of the economy. And finally, in the coordinated action scenario, we see just that. Industry, government and the broader economy acting in concert to decarbonise quickly. The way we modelled the industry-led scenario, where industry goes it alone, was by using a 1.5 degree aligned carbon budget for just the industry sector and a 2 degree budget for the rest of the economy. We compared those results with coordinated action, where the 1.5 degree carbon budget was applied to the entire economy. When comparing the abatement achieved across the three scenarios, we see a number of significant differences. When industry bears more of the burden to decarbonise, we see higher energy costs, a slower pace of emissions reductions, and a higher reliance on land-based sequestration to align with the carbon budgets and reach net zero. This can be seen in the graph here by comparing the emission reductions by 2030 in industry-led and coordinated action, and in the larger light green sequestration sector for industry-led in 2050, despite this having a higher economy-wide carbon budget. When we play out the industry-led scenario further, it, it has weak incentives to decarbonise and a lack of government leadership. And this leads to slower overall grid decarbonisation and generally reduced support for industry efforts to cut electricity emissions. In the coordinated action scenario, there's no such handbrake on decarbonising the grid and industry action. We also see relatively higher costs for energy inputs and renewable hydrogen in industry-led, which creates further disincentives for industrial action without wider support. In this chart, the blue bars show the price of renewable hydrogen by state in the industry-led scenario. And as you can see, it sits above most prices in the other scenarios. All of these factors combine to portray a much less desirable decarbonisation pathway in the industry-led scenario, particularly for the industry sector, but also for the broader economy. When looking at Australia's decarbonisation pathway and trying to understand the optimal ways to get there, scenario results like these can be a really interesting starting point to inform the discussion. Another factor we paid close attention to in the modelling was gas prices for the east coast of Australia. We compared the impacts of increasing gas prices through a sensitivity analysis. As I mentioned earlier, this is a way we compare results when just one parameter is changed, allowing us to isolate the impacts of that particular measure. In this case, we wanted to understand how the results might change as gas prices increase, ranging from $14 a gigajoule up to $32 a gigajoule. To give you some orientation, wholesale gas prices have been roughly around the $15 to $20 a gigajoule mark over the last month. What we found was that at and above the $21 a gigajoule price point, we saw a significant increase in hydrogen production overall and a shift towards more renewable hydrogen. So the chart here shows how much how the gas prices influence the production in the coordinated action scenario. The light green represents green hydrogen, which is produced from 100% renewable energy. The dark blue is blue hydrogen, which is produced using gas with CCS. And the grey represents grey hydrogen produced from gas without CCS. At the very left of the chart, where pr gas prices are low, um, and it's our base coordinated action scenario, we see 19% green hydrogen in 2030, and gas-based production makes up over 80% of the total. Now, if you take a look at the right hand side of the chart in the same time frame with the same assumptions, but dialing the gas prices up to the maximum level, we see hyd green hydrogen share jump from 19 to 90%. You can also see there that blue and gray hydrogen production is significantly reduced, along with the role of blue hydrogen as a potential transitional energy source, showing how dependent um, these shares of hydrogen production are on the price. The sensitivity also provided insights into the selection of decarbonisation technologies for certain industrial sectors, as well as the speed at which the technologies are introduced. In steel production, for example, a number of technologies are initially gas-based, shifting to hydrogen over time as supply becomes more widespread and cheaper. The sensitivity analysis showed that the shift to hydrogen steelmaking happens a lot more quickly at higher gas prices, and it requires significantly more hydrogen earlier on. 
in alumina production, we saw that the calcination process, which is responsible for about two thirds of the energy use, was rapidly electrified as gas prices increased. So in this case, the higher gas price incentivized the sector to move away from gas directly to electricity, rather than waiting for the cost of green hydrogen to reduce. Understanding the effect of gas prices allows us to provide a better picture of the least cost pathway for industry to take to reach net zero emissions. And seeing how the results varied with the sensitivity builds confidence in the modelling as well. Being able to share these sort of findings with stakeholders was a really important part of the conversations we had around the robustness of the results and helped broaden the evidence base available for decision making in these key areas. So that was a whirlwind tour through some of the really interesting things we uncovered through our scenario and sensitivity approach to modelling. When tackling a decarbonisation challenge as large as this, it's vital that we can dig in and understand what's going on behind the top level results. It's also vital to communicate these insights and how they can be used by decision makers when looking to the future. The more information or guidance about the impact of various factors, the better, especially when we're looking to make such a massive change on a national scale in a short time frame. Back to you, Michael. Thank you, Ari. Thanks so much for sharing those insights. Um, I do love myself a good uh, sensitivity analysis, so it was great for you to be able to um, present that and share the insights um, that, as you say, went beyond some of the headline numbers that I know came out of, um, came out of that modelling. Now, what we've heard from our two presenters, Ro Maxwell and Glenn Curry, is two different contexts in which Climeworks has offered advice on decarbonisation pathways backed by scenario modelling. These initiatives and the specific insights that Roe and Glenn have picked out today offer just a preview of the value that's offered by tools like scenario analysis when we as Climeworks and others provide our advice to companies, industries and governments. Now that we've heard from our speakers, it's now time to open the floor for audience questions. Firstly, thanks to those who have asked questions in advance. And we'll actually kick off by asking one of those pre-asked questions, which I've adapted from Ebony and David. So thanks Ebony and David for uh, your versions of this question. And this is over to you, Glenn. So from what you've read of AMO's energy system plans and also based on Climeworks Centre's insights, are there any particular industries or regions that should be the focus area for further action? Well, thanks, Michael, and thanks, David and uh, uh, Amber. When we think about the uh, energy transition, um, of course, there's people involved and there are people affected when we close coal mines and uh, change from gas. So we have to consider that there's a political angle to the transition, and that basically means if we look at transi transiting, we need to consider those regions and the social economic aspects of the transition. So therefore, that's going to guide government uh, decisions. But certainly the two that I mentioned there on the uh, the last slide, you know, um, Gladstone and Hunter would be uh, good candidates, huge coal industry, and their, their ability to transition will allow us to um, uh, replace those jobs that are closing in coal mines and put them into uh, solar and wind and transmission, et cetera. The other, the other consideration, and it's a, it's a much broader one, which is, uh, making sure that we're in that process of utilising Australia's strength in minerals and mining and moving to clean products from our mining. And that's going to require factories being built for minerals processing. Um, one example might be the precursor minerals for batteries, for example, and start that process of cleaning up our industrial processes. As Roe explained, uh, there's appetite there and the technology's there, but uh, we just need to, to head in that direction. That's the opportunity that opens up from, uh, from my thinking of uh, a lot of the AEMO modelling. Fantastic, Glenn. Thanks for that. And um, while we're on that, I've got another follow-up question from you, which um, someone astutely observed that the majority of projects for solar wind farms seem to be located on the east coast of Australia from what you presented from the, um, the AEMO um plans so i was wondering if you had any insights on um why it seems like the majority of projects are located on the east coast well thank you um and and again that question's uh, quite astute with, with the modeling so far in the 2022 isp it's all in the nem which what's known as the nem the eastern part of australia but we have started that process of modeling western australia so we've got the whole of australia now in our model so um Certainly, West Australia has got wind and solar. 
uh, projects, but they weren't shown on that because we were representing the AEMO model, which wasn't only including the eastern states up until uh, 2022. Thanks, Glenn. And yeah, certainly what I've observed as well from the, the approach that we've seen in the AMO energy system planning is um, a much more integrated um, approach between the east and the west coast over the last few years as well. So um, uh, yeah, as I think as Glenn says, a lot of the focus has been on the national electricity market, the NEM, but increasingly there will be more of that focus coming on what happens over on the west coast as well. Um, I've got a question for you now, Ro. Um, which is around technologies like green hydrogen and carbon capture. And I was wondering, what, from our modelling, what are the sorts of opportunities that those technologies can play in the transition for the really hard to abate sectors like industrial heat and others that we've looked at through our modelling? That's a great question, Michael. Um, and for both of these, there's definitely a time and a place um, and different scenarios where they'd be more or less useful and applicable. Um, what you called out, industrial heat, is a really strong candidate for the application of green hydrogen. Um, green hydrogen won't cure all our problems, but that is one area where if, you, if it's very hard to electrify a certain process, um, getting electricity to provide that high temperature heat for a lot of industrial sectors just doesn't seem to be happening um, in the current sort of technology development pathways. Green hydrogen could come in and provide a solution there. In terms of carbon capture, it really depends on the process um, and whether there are alternatives available. Um, the experiences with carbon capture in Australia to date have been um, not uh, the most desirable. So there's still a long way to go to bring that technology up to a space where it can really contribute at the level that would be needed. Thanks, Ro. And there's quite a number of questions um, themed broadly around electrification of those hard to abate sectors as well. So I guess I've got a follow up question for you around um, generally when there's industrial users that uh, have challenges in trans transitioning away from fossil gas, for example, where they can't electrify easily. Um, does our modelling have a preference between, I guess, different technology options, including biomethane or hydrogen or continued use of fossil gas? I would say generally it comes down to the input costs into the model. So there are a number of uh, places where biomethane could be seen to be almost a drop in technology for fossil gas. Um, and then there's another uh, another set of technologies, I guess, that would probably need to be replaced to enable the use of hydrogen rather than fossil gas. So in the end, in the, in the modelling, it comes down to, in the end, what the cost balance ends up being. Um, for that investment, whether bioenergy is available in the areas um, that the industry is located. Um, and there are a lot of really complex factors in scaling up a bioenergy industry as well, that um, at this stage, we we haven't like dove, divin dove into, into, our, um, into our research. Thanks, Joe. Now, I've got another question for you, Glenn, which is about gas and electrification, actually. And um, I guess from your reading of the, the AMO integrated system plan, um, do you have any insights on why gas peaking is still present in the plan? And actually, um, I think according to this question, continues to grow over time. I guess there's a question there around if there's a narrative around shifting away from gas, you know, why is gas peaking still present in the AMO future plans for the energy sector? Well, and that's one that, um, you know, as at ClimateWorks, of course, we want to get rid of gas uh, out of the system, but uh, we recognise that we are modelling for least cost. So one of the things that can allow us to get the level of carbon in the system down is to uh, recognise that the option, if we don't have some peaking gas, is a whole lot more solar and wind uh, generation and storage is required. So the peaking gas doesn't need to be on very much. It might be five or 10 minutes a year, and it can save billions of dollars of additional infrastructure. So one of the things and the reasons that it's still in there is that it's giving us a, a very different profile to the current gas system, which is running uh, most of the time, most, a lot of it is, um, and moving it across to just peaking. And as I said, it might be just minutes a year uh, to allow us to not have to build that extra generation and storage. 
Yeah, that that makes sense. And I guess, um, um, Glenn, I feel like there's this distinction between capacity and total generation that needs to be made. Is that right? Or in terms of the future of gas in the electricity system? Well, well, when you when you consider, and this is one of the points I made in the last slide, that when we move from a fossil based system across to a solar wind uh, system. Uh, we have to figure out how to manage those times when there's a peak load, which is, um, you know, the winter peak in the southern states and a summer peak in the northern states. And those peaks um, may not be a, a time when we've got plenty of solar and wind. So it's really just finding ways to maybe work with industry to move their load. Um, that's something that already in the last 20 years we've been uh, with the aluminium pot lines, they've been putting uh, pot lines aside for periods when there's not enough electricity in the system. So it's quite feasible that that would be extended to other industries. So, for example, with uh, refrigeration, which is a big industrial or commercial load, um, there is no with proper uh, insulation on the on the refrigeration. You can move that load quite uh, significantly. You don't have to turn on the compressor at uh, this time, you can move it half an hour and it really doesn't make any difference to the, uh, to the cool of that, um, that refrigerator. Perfect, thanks for that, Glenn. Um, and just one more follow-up question on the storage side of things, because uh, I guess even in spite of um, all these other measures that you talked about and also around having capacity for gas peaking, uh, as we saw from the presentation, the AMO's system planning is still wanting to account for a 30 times increase in storage capacity. And I'm assuming that's battery storage capacity, but I was wondering if you had any insights from your reading of AMO's plans, what sorts of technologies they're considering as part of that kind of increased storage capacity in the electricity grid? At present, we uh, have both hydro, pumped hydro and uh, electrical storage in the in the modeling and in the system so that's uh, that's something that the current technology is pumped hydro and lithium batteries basically is the majority but there are other flow batteries that are considered so redox is a, one of the systems and the model doesn't have to guess what the technology is it just needs to work out how much storage is needed and then the technology might change. So we've, we've moved to lithium iron, for example, that's one of the lithium technologies. And uh, we might well move to another uh, form of uh, solid state uh, sort of storage. So it's uh, the model has uh, tried to look at the lowest, least cost. And at the moment, lithium iron and uh, pumped hydro are the two that's sitting there in the, uh, in the use expected, uh, expected use. And, uh, really uh, looking at what's the likely benefit to the system. Uh, there's quite a significant difference between a battery, a lithium battery that's scheduled and not scheduled, um, that's orchestrated, that is the term that's used. Uh, when we talk about a battery being orchestrated, that's uh, something that allows the electricity system to call on it when it's short of inertia or um, uh, frequency control or what other need of the system. Uh, at the moment, most home batteries are not orchestrated, um, and it's only very few of the community batteries that are orchestrated. So, so the very big distinction um, between batteries that are controlled and ones that are not controlled. That's great. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Ro, I've got a question for you now, going back to the modelling as a tool and the modelling that we use at, at Climateworks for, um, for these case studies that we've been talking about today in this webinar. Um, could you could you explain why I guess we at Climeworks we primarily in these case studies we've primarily been modelling for the least cost outcome rather than some other outcomes that would clearly be judged to be um, super important as well so things like the just transition or you know other social and economic aspects or environmental aspects. Yeah, that's that's a really good point to bring up, and it's it's definitely been an important lens that we had to filter our results through, um, and and work on when we when we finish the modelling for the industry ETI project. So the way that our model runs is is a least cost basis, and that's that's what we're working with. Um, it gives sort of a def a defined sort of angle to take, um, and it makes it really 
sort of clear to input all our technology options on a, an equivalent basis. But what we have to do once we get the results from the modeling is really um, discuss them, interrogate them and analyze them with the context of the world that we're living in. So a large part of our project um, was months and months of uh, talking to our partners, talking to other stakeholders and just understanding what the, the extra barriers to implementation would be, all the challenges, um, and the other issues that we have to overcome that could not be represented by a cost of technology in a model. And so while the modeling itself does only take um, the cost and the emissions intensity and energy intensity into account, um, the work itself and our final outputs and recommendations were all based around our in-depth discussions with a number of industry partners on, on what it would really take to try and shift the dial and decarbonize industry. Yeah, and that's a really great point you make there about the fact that the the modelling itself has its own um, strengths, but its own limitations as well. And it's really the starting point, the evidence base for whether the recommendations we get out of it as well. Uh, it's very rare that we would directly get recommendations from the modelling without having some level of interpretation on that. So um, yeah, that's 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 a great kind of I guess um, link to make there between the modelling itself and the actual um, recommendations we put forward. I guess speaking of which, Ro, on the um, some of the the sort of constraints that we don't have in our modelling, but need to still take into account in our recommendations. Um, have you have you come across any I guess uh, conversations around the availability and supply constraints potentially of different technologies? And there's a question here specifically about hydrogen electrolyzers, for example. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the availability of um, different abatement technologies could be a big constraint for Australia to decarbonise? And again, to what extent have we been incorporating that into our modelling, but also into our recommendations as well? Yeah, that's that's a really good question, Michael. Um, and and the, the simple answer about the modelling is that it can be taken into account. And in some areas where we understand there may be a delay, we include a, a sort of build time from the commercial availability, um, meaning that the technology couldn't be taken up for an extra two or three years, for example. Um, and I completely agree with the, the premise of the question. Absolutely, we don't manufacture many of these or any of these technologies onshore at the moment. So we are very much dependent on a global supply chain to, to be able to um, transition through to some of these technologies. Yes, yeah, so yes, absolutely, it could be a factor in, in slowing the decarbonisation. Now we've got to change tack a little bit, going back to some of the, I guess, conversations around gas and electrification. And as I said, Ro, I, I do love the sensitivity analysis. And um, just on the, I guess, the gas price sensitivity that you mentioned, could you provide some insights on some of the rationale for some of the different assumptions that were made for the different gas price sensitivity scenarios? Yeah, sure. So we, we um, at the time, so these were generated, I think, at least six months ago. Um, and at the time we were looking at our core assumptions in our main modeling being sort of at least 50% lower sometimes than some of the spot prices we we're seeing on the market. And we were really aware that publishing with just that um, main baseline of a gas price would not give results necessarily that I guess could be interrogated at the level that we wanted to, especially when we we're seeing the massive spikes in prices and, and variability as well. So the way we went was looking at long-term contracts, um, maximum spot prices over sort of a, a three or four month period um, at the start of 2022, um, as well as some work from, I think it was Deloitte. It's, it's referenced in our technical report, um, which gave us a, a trajectory, a declining trajectory. So taking the spikes into account and gently declining over time. Um, and so we ran this the scenario with a number of different prices. We had a lot of flat prices at 14, 21 and 32, as well as sort of a, a spike and then a declining declining price as well. So we just wanted to sort of canvas a lot of different bases. And it was interesting to see how the results tended to be kind of similar despite having either the flat price or the variability over time. Um, and it gave us a really nice sort of breadth of um, results, I suppose, to, to draw upon when we're talking about something that was very uncertain what the future of the gas price looked like. Yeah, that's that's great. And um, I guess going 
along with the gas theme, a question back to, to Glenn. There, there are quite a number of questions about gas and electrification as well, slightly different elements of those um, of those issues, but um, it's clearly a lot of interest in, in that as a topic. Um, going back to the gas peaking point made before, Glenn, do you see gas peaking uh, and gas peaking generation playing a key role in, I guess, firming for renewable energy, or is it assumed that when you're kind of looking at um, um, sectors like it, like industry, would it be more reasonable to assume that industry will kind of conform to energy availability and actually adjust their demand and be required to adjust their dem demand in response to, you know, whatever signals they get from the broader market? Well, if we think about the firming side of renewable uh, systems, we've got to consider that the majority of the heavy lifting has to be outside of gas because gas is, as I said, probably in our modelling, going to be just in a matter of minutes a year. So most of the heavy lifting has to be in that whole range of energy efficiency, electrification um, systems that are, are controllable. You know, I talked about batteries being controllable, uh, the ability for industry to shift their load, the whole technology side of controlling refrigeration and other things such that we can... Uh, make the transition without building ridiculously, um, uh, you know, huge amounts of solar and wind that are going to cover for every every opportunity. Because of course, if we uh, build too much, uh, effectively, uh, event, eventually, it's most of us going to be sitting there unused most of the time. So when we consider the uh, the variability in our load, it really is uh, peaking around uh, the domestic load is peaking in the early morning and then at night as we come home and on the stove and the uh, the air conditioning and most likely plug in our electric car. So those peaks are a huge problem for our system at the moment in spite of our uh, significant fossil system holding, um, holding the system. Uh, we are learning how to manage that at the moment so that the significant renewable um, generation in South Australia has been teaching the Australian energy manage, management, uh, how to do that without having blackouts. And that's, that occurred in 1998, and then we another one in uh, 2007. Um, we, we've had a series of South Australian blackouts, and now we haven't. Uh, in this last, last year, we had that um, uh, transmission breakdown, and there were actions that were taken by the AMO to make sure that, that the light stayed on in South Australia. And similarly, in the uh, first quarter of this year, we've seen very high renewable content in South South Australia, Victoria and uh, Tasmania. In the first uh, quarter, right through the first quarter, we were seeing prices in the negative uh, in those those markets. And that's purely dr driven by renewable energy being the uh, price setter. So uh, right across the border in New South Wales and Queensland, they were paying 80 to $100 while we were paying minus 50 in Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania. So very, very significant lessons in that in balancing the system um, we're in that in that process already of uh, that transition thanks glenn and um we've had so many great questions coming through they're coming in thick and fast and they continue to come in thick and fast so thanks so much for that we only really have time for a couple more questions now so um if we don't um get to the questions you've asked uh, apologies but yeah hopefully you've still found this conversation uh really useful uh, I guess I've got a question for, for both Glenn and Rose. I'll be interested in both of your perspectives from an industry and an energy perspective. And this is about um, e the export narrative, the export opportunities. So I guess um, the question is in terms of our modeling for industry, but also in terms of our modeling for energy and also the way in which AMO is approaching the energy system planning, how have uh, export opportunities for things like hydrogen come into play in both the modeling and the planning side of things. So I go to Ro first to talk about the industry modeling. Yeah, certainly. So this was um, one of the other major sensitivities that we decided to model, um, which I didn't highlight the results from this today, um, but it, we had a scenario coordinated action with exports because we really did want to investigate what it looks like in, in the energy system if there is a significant demand for a hydrogen export. Um, so we based our assumptions on some work that, that we'd done with AMO previously, which Glenn was discussing, um, and used a, quite a large export demand by 2050. I think it was 50 million tonnes um, of hydrogen. 
I think. I'll have to check that in the report. Um, and what we found was significant changes throughout the energy system, um, especially in the areas where the hydrogen was produced. Um, it really did push things to the max and was a really interesting look at what, what did shift and how it impacted other sectors um, and, and what the changes were. Um, it's it's for the modelling itself, we did look at hydrogen only, but we're aware that ammonia could be another source of energy export. Um, and the, there's quite a large discussion ongoing, I think, about the most effective way to export energy from Australia, making the most of our renewables. Um, but yeah, so far, we've just looked at a hydrogen export in ours. Over to you, Glenn. Thank you, Ro. Um, so with that role of hydrogen, there's no question that it'll be important for process heat and the use of that for our minerals processing that I mentioned is going to be really important. Um, and by every means, uh, we, we could bring a lot of that minerals processing back to Australia that's being currently exported. Um, at the moment, uh, Australia, for example, exports 52% of the global lithium and it all gets processed overseas uh, pretty much at the moment. So, so that, that's as an example where we could bring it on shore. Uh, that process um, wouldn't be the one that would be using hydrogen, but that, that's just an example of where we, we can bring those um, mineral exports and process them here, utilise the uh, hydrogen, and in that way export our renewable energy. Um, certainly some of the technology for export with um, other methanol or um, ammonia might come through. At the moment, that's that's in the pipeline. So we haven't actually got clear technology solutions for that export. So it's not something that I put a particularly high uh, priority on. I think that the, um, the very exciting opportunity is that idea that we would utilise our renewable energy to make hydrogen and process uh, minerals here in Australia. Thanks, both of you. And, and there's so much conversation that we could go into around that idea, Glenn, you just mentioned around, um, I guess, onshoring some of that processing as well. But we won't go into that. Um, for our final question, again, I'm going to throw it to both of you for, from both of your different perspectives. And it's a fairly simple question in its wording, which uh, is, can we power industry for 100% renewables or close to it? And what needs to happen both in terms of industry technologies but also in terms of energy system planning in order to actually enable that so i might i might go to to glenn first well thank you you know that transition that we're talking about really is not just about technology and as i said earlier in my slides the technology is known and pretty much we can do it using our existing technology so that it then really is a question of four different parameters. One is the system and the enabling environment. So that's the uh, things like the transmission planning that we're doing and what we presented today. Um, the financial sector, and uh, there's a lot of actions that our, our colleagues at um, Climate Works are working on financial uh, standards that allows for climate finance to be better defined. Uh, the governance and institutions around climate change, and that's a big focus of uh, climate works. And the fourth is really that socioeconomic uh, aspect of the transition, which I've touched on a couple of times. Uh, it includes Indigenous uh, communities, uh, First Nations communities, and um, s s a fairness in that process, because otherwise the transition will lose a um, the, the ability to... Uh, to continue it will lose its social license so the transition has to include social socioeconomic views uh, and climate works really does a lot of work in that area um, as well perhaps over to you Ro in terms of that transition sure um, and thinking about whether we can power industry from 100% renewables uh, it, it, it's a challenge and it's a, it's a big question. Um, I think the, the, I guess, rejoinder to it is at, at what cost as well. So there's, there's a number of technologies and, and supply chains that are suited to more variable processing and more variable sources of energy. And some of them that, that strongly aren't as we've, as we've discussed today, the aluminium sector for one to call out. So um, 
I think at, at a very high price with um, enough storage, absolutely, you would you would be able to get there if you could get the reliability high enough. But it's it's sort of a bit of a balancing act. Um, and one of the things that we noted in the ETI work was that the industry emissions reduction didn't get to uh, net zero. We reduced emissions by 92% in our most ambitious scenario. And this kind of shows that across our economy, there's different sectors that can decarbonize more easily or that it's more difficult for some. And this is where uh, coordination, as Glenn was saying, across all the different sectors and actors is really, really important to get to the optimal outcome for Australia's decarbonization. Thanks both. And that does bring us to the end of our discussion. Um, I've had a lot of fun getting insights from, from both Ro and Glenn. It's been really fascinating for me and I hope so for the audience and for the listeners as well. Thank you to Ro and to Glenn and also to our team behind the scenes for, for putting this event together. Now, just in closing, you can find out more about our work and catch up on uh, this briefing room and also previous briefing rooms at our website, climateworkcenter.org. And just so you know, we will be sending through a recording from this session and links to the resources that we discussed here today. So do keep an eye out on your inbox for that and for more briefing room events from the team at Climaworks. Thank you again for joining us and see you next time.